the first question is. Oh, I'm recording. The first question. Like recording? Yeah, I'm recording. So would you like to record? You're welcome to do so. If you'd like to, I'll give you permission. Uh, sure thing. Okay, well, let me. Where are you? There you are. Are you coming? Are you coming in from a uh, VPN or something? Because it doesn't say that. Uh... Not a VPN. Um, so oh, I'm just connected your... to my. All right, I'll send you a recording when we're done. So, because it is okay, not cool that you record. All right, so yeah, uh, no worries. First one. Uh, so the first one's one four two five four eight one. Ooh. You should definitely know 144. Let me uh, shrink this down. I have it big because when I do share with people, they sometimes uh, are on their cell phone. Okay, so this is called Rule 144. A good way to remember this is 144. Mm -hmm. Once I file this form, it's good for 90 days. I can sell 1% of the outstanding stock or the average of the last four weeks of volume whichever is greater, and I can do that up to four times a year. So there's 10 million shares outstanding. So the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to times that by 1%. Okay. As we, as we said, that's what you can do. You can do 1%. So it's whichever greater, so we're going to times that by 1%. And uh, that's 100,000 shares. So that's our first step. Yeah, let's get the smaller font here. Okay, so the next thing is, boy, Kaplan being jerks. The last four weeks trading volume, right? So I think where they're being jerks here is they're giving you five weeks trading volume. And we need the last four, right? So there's the last four. And so then we're going to total those up. I'll get out my calculator, 80,000 uh, plus... 125,000 uh, plus 135 plus 100. And then we're going to divide by four. It's the average of the last four weeks trading volume. And so uh, here it says the following trading volume. Based on this information, oh, the control person, there it is. So the control person. So when we add up the last four weeks trading volume and we divide, that's 110. And it was, we said, you can do uh, whichever is greater. And so. So 110, right. okay. Yep. Okay, so that makes sense. Yeah, I think the, the um, thing that we hear was jerky was Kappa gave you five weeks trading volume. Right, you need the last four or the last four weeks trading volume. So in this example, last four weeks ending February 11th through March 4th, is uh, four weeks is 110, so it's 110 it is. I think that's pretty testable. I, you know, I'd be prepared to do that on the test. Okay, got it. Okay, what's next? Um, so the next one is 1263976. One, two, three, nine, seven, six. Three, nine, seven, six. Let me clear up my screen here. Uh, new offering has 800,000 units at six. Now a unit is more than one security offered together. So when I call you and say, hey, uh, Jerry, I got uh, uh, a unit for you. And each of these units consists of two shares of common stock and one warrant. Each warrant is to purchase a half a share of the common stock. Based on this information, how many shares will be sold and how many warrants will be sold? Uh, kind of a, you know, a tricky one here. So we said each unit consists of two shares of common. So, so you just multiply... Yeah, yeah, 800 uh, times two shares, that's a million six. Yep. And it says, uh, and each unit has a warrant. So that's 800,000 warrants. Now, I think what they probably were trying to get you to do is go further that and try to figure out, you know, how many shares you're going to get. Uh, I don't know what your miss was, but I, I think B would be easy to miss because maybe you're trying to figure out how much stock you can buy with the warrants, and that's 400,000 shares. That's not what B says, but, you know, that's uh, what you do. All right, what's our next one? Are you there? Hello? Uh, I can't hear you. I lost you. Can you hear me? There you go. You're back. Hello. 
Well, you were back. I hear yeah, some. I think I just lost you there. Momentary. There you go. Okay. <laughs> okay. What's our, what's our next one? Um, sorry, I didn't hear the last part of the explanation. Oh, okay. um, so I know well, how you I got to one point six. Yeah. What I said is that uh, if you miss this, uh, maybe what you did was think that they were you were asking how many shares could you get with the warrants, which is four hundred thousand shares, even though that answer is not available to you. But I could see B as a miss, but it's, it's still a miss. Right, because each unit consists of two shares of common. That's a million six, and it says and a warrant. Period. Full stop. Eight hundred thousand warrants, and then each warrant is you purchase a half a share. That's just meaningless BS. That has nothing to do with answering the question. The question has been asked, been answered in that first sentence. Got it. Okay. okay what's our next one? So the next one's one four three six seven three one. Six seven three one. Your client makes two municipal bond purchases from your firm's trading desk. One of the bonds has a nominal yield of five. Now that's important because remember nominal yield also means the fixed or stated rate of return. That also means the coupon. And basis is the fancy word for yield to maturity. And so when you get your teeter totter fired up, your seesaw, you'd say, okay, that's a bond at a discount. That's a bond at a discount. The other bond has a coupon of seven and a half. Wow. And a yield to maturity of six. And so that is a bond at a premium. Now, what you're supposed to know about buying a bond at a premium is that you have to do straight line amortization downward. You have to adjust that bond each year. So when it matures, right, if your client holds both bonds to maturity, the tax consequences when receiving the principal will be no gain or no loss because you've been making that adjustment each year. So that's another tough one. So let's see what the explanation says. The first bond is selling a discount. We were able to figure that out because we know the basis is six and the coupon is five. The second bond is selling at a premium. We know that because it's a, got a basis of six and an anomalous seven and a half. Because the bonds were purchased from the trading desk, we know these are secondary market trades and not original issue discount. That's what that means. They're telling you this discount is not like a zero where you have to do accretion and no taxes. Munu bonds purchased in the secondary market at discount that have the discount accreted and taxed as ordinary income each year. So we're doing accretion upward and accretion downward and boom, that's why there's no gain or loss. The discount has been fully created and so has the premium. So a tough one. Uh, if you missed this one, I would have missed it perhaps with uh, thinking I got a capital gain and a capital loss on the other one. And I would Yeah, have that's that's what I chose. Yeah. Okay, what's our next one? Okay. Um so one three nine one zero two three. One three nine one zero two three. An investor is looking for current income while wishing to reduce interest rate would most likely find which of the following investments suitable. So let's uh, look for some key words here. An investor looking for current income and wishing to reduce interest rate risk would most likely find which of the following investments suitable. Okay, well, first thing is it says interest rate risk. So we have a treasury note in eight years. We have a preferred stock callable in three years. We have a strip in five. And a duration is a measurement of volatility. Uh, and here we're saying the average of that unit investment trust is a portfolio. Another real tough one, another real tough one. Um, let's see what they say. One of the features of the UM, unit investment trust is as a defined end date. Okay. The bonds held in the UIT in our question mature in five years. Regardless of how high current market interest rates rise, bonds pay off at base when they mature. Um, listen, sometimes you read a rationale and like, okay, well, yeah, now that you tell me that, but I mean, I'm not so sure how are we supposed to know that from the question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> responding that way. <laughs> for maturity, the greater interest rates. Now we should have known that. So we should know that the longer term bonds are going to have uh, more volatility. Um, by the way, we should have been able to toss out the strip because the strip doesn't have current income, right? So we should have been able to toss that out. Anyways, they makes the treasury notes 
uh, less acceptable choice. That's that that we should have known. The eight years is going to be more volatile and have more risk than the five years. Uh, let's see what they tell us about this preferred stock. Uh, you can assume that a callable security, there we go, preferred or debt is not going to be called unless interest rates go down. Uh, remember when interest rates declined, fixed income investments rise. And so the investor would not want the stock to be called away. The strips in five years, there's coupon, pay no income in the interim. Um, of all the questions thus far we've done, this is not my the, my least favorite. I just don't really think this reflects something you're going to actually see on your actual exam. So, okay, you know, fine, Kaplan. You know, this is one of the ones you go, okay, whatever. But uh, hey, what you do need to know about UIT is let's just talk about what you do need to know. Yeah. Uh, unit investment trust, test question, have a fixed portfolio. So, you know, the assets are professionally selected. The assets are professionally selected. But then once they're selected, they go in there and nobody's managing them. They're not being actively managed. Test question. They are passively managed. So it's a fixed portfolio and it is passively managed. Now, since it's ma ma passively managed, they're typically going to have a lower operating expense than would, uh, you know, an actively managed like mutual fund or something. Okay, what's our next one? So the next one is 126441. Oh, 126441. 126441. Oh, sorry. 126441. Okay. Disclosure is a control relationship. So a control relationship is like Merrill Lynch is controlled by Bank of America. There's a control relationship between Bank of America and Merrill Lynch. And so now we're asking what disclosures need to be made to a customer of Merrill about that relationship. Do we have to disclose uh, in a principal transaction? So what we mean there is if we sell you Bank of America stock, mm -hmm. right? And I'm a Merrill broker. I got to say, well, Jerry, well, obviously we love Bank of America because we're, you know, captive. We're a subsidiary of Merrill, so we love them. Do we have to disclose this if we charge it an agency transaction? What this means in plain English is you're buying Bank of America stock from Merrill Lynch. And so Merrill Lynch has to disclose to you that there's a control relationship. One other one. I call you up. I'm a Merrill broker. I say, hey, have you been following the bromance with uh, Brian Monahan, our CEO at Berkshire Hathaway? Warren Buffett, man, these guys are really getting along terrifically. Uh, I think you should buy a thousand shares. And you say, well, Dean, you have a discretionary authority on my account. If you think I should buy Bank of America, I don't know why you're bothering me. I said, well, I'm not allowed to use my discretionary authority when there's a control relationship. Mm -hmm. and what I'm going to have to do is get your permission. So, you know, a mayor broker can't buy Bank of America stock into a customer account without uh, you know using his discretionary authority. That was tough. I, but again, sometimes these questions, I think this is fair. I'm just not sure, you know, if, unless you know what a control relationship and you know what that means that you'd be able to answer this question. Uh, I think this is more of like a, maybe a 24 or a 910 question. You know, 910 yeah. is sales supervisors and 24 is a general securities principle. Uh, the nature of any control relationship or conflict of interest must be disclosed to customers. Yes. You know, sunlight's the best disinfectant, so our default should be, yeah, we're going to tell everybody everything, right? That includes uh, primary, secondary. Yep. Yeah. Okay. What's our next one? Um, one, two, six, five, eight, seven, seven. All the following deal in the secondary market. Wow. Okay. Well, you should know a notice of sale is in the bond buyer. And, you know, the notice of sale is attention, attention, municipal finance. We're looking to sell some bonds here. And, you know, and then I, we get the bond buyer. And if I work public finance, uh, maybe I work public finance at UBS and I call you and I say, hey, you see the notice of sale in the bond bar? I said, I'm think forming a syndicate. Would you like to join my syndicate? He said, well, Dean, I'm forming a competing syndicate. I go, oh, say it ain't so. So you should have known that now notice of sale is about the primary market, not the secondary market. Now, dealer quotes, we have a bond desk. So, you know, uh, not every firm has a bond desk, but UBS certainly does. Uh, Goldman Sachs certainly does. And you would call the bond desk and say, I'm looking for a quote on my city of Los Angeles geo bonds. And I say, okay, here's my uh, quote. My bid is 98 and an eighth. 
And my ask is 98 and a quarter, my offer. They're that very testable. The difference between the dealer's bid and offer is called the spread. Oh, the spread. And the minimum spread I'm making when I'm trading munis is an eighth. Corporate munis trade in eighths. A broker's broker, I haven't had anybody tell me they've seen the broker's broker in a long time, but a broker's broker is a broker for other brokers. <laughs> so if I'm working the uh, bond desk and I'm tired of looking at these bonds, I go, man, I don't know what's up with my brokers. Why can't my brokers make these bonds go bye-bye? I mean, you know, they've been sitting here a long time. So I call a, a broker's broker, the largest broker's broker in the country is J.J. Kenny. And I can say, hey, J.J. Kenny, can you show these to the street for me? And I'm trying to make these things go bye-bye. You know, a broker's broker is kind of like an inventory reduction specialist for a guy, right? And then he's got to get on the phone. He's going to call. Maybe he calls the bond desk at Merrill Lynch and says, hey, uh, J.J. Kenny here. I know you have those brokers who are killer when it comes to these uh, munis. Uh, let me share them with you. And then uh, Merrill says, yeah, those, those are beautiful. We'll take them. And then the broker broker calls me back. And he said, Dean, I got them done. They want to know if there's some more behind that. I go, yeah, show them some more. Who's the other side of the trade? Listen, you must be new. If you tell the person the other side of the trade, they're going to get rid of you. Mm -hmm. right? So the other question, it used to show up quite a bit. I haven't had somebody tell me they've seen it in a long time. But the other question used to show up quite a bit is the broker's broker protects the customer's identity. Now, we make it sound like it's for highfalutin reasons that a broker's broker protects the customer's identity. But I think it's a little more obvious if you're a broker's broker, you're between UBS and Merrill Lynch. And you tell UBS or Merrill Lynch that you're in the middle of who the other sides are, you know, they're going to take you out of the trade, right? They're just going <laughs> to, Dave, you must be new. He just told us it was me and it was you. So let's just do it together. And then um, Thompson's market, Muni Market Monitor, I haven't had anybody ever tell me they've seen that. Now, I'm going to stand up for uh, the subject matter expert at Kaplan in this question. Because even though nobody has ever seen D, remember, it is a distractor. It is a wrong answer. So that means it's fair game to put wrong answers in there that you know aren't testable. And I would still say you should have been held accountable to know that notice of sale most certainly is not associated with the secondary market. You should definitely know that's going to be a competitive offering of munis where syndicates are going to be formed. And then remember, we're going to, we're going to submit our bids and whoever, based on the notice of sale information, provides the issue where the lowest net interest cost is going to win that underwriting. So... You're going to get lots of muni questions, you know, 20 uh, easy muni questions on the seven. So um, this one's a little esoteric, but, you know. All right. What's our next one? Cool. Um, so the next one is one, two, six, five, eight, seven, seven. Oh, wait, sorry. That was the one that we just did. Okay. Um, so one, two, eight, two, nine, eight, four. Uh, recent years have shown enormous growth in the sales of ETFs. That is certainly true. Some of the benefits of using ETFs in your client portfolio would include. So this is very testable to be able to compare and contrast an ETF with an open-end mutual fund. And, you know, in an open-end mutual fund, remember, you lose tax control of your investments. Because in an open-end mutual fund, you don't decide when to sell the security. The fund manager does. And the fund manager isn't really thinking about your personal tax return. I mean, we're going to rate them for tax efficiency, but that's not really what they're thinking. And so the answer is, since the ETF for test purposes is passively managed, it's going to have lower costs and it's going to have greater tax efficiency than the traditional open and mutual. And what I, what I mean traditional is we... The way these things up are set up, our ETFs are still legally set up as open-end funds. But, you know, that's not how we test you on them. But, you know, what we're asking you to do is compare it with a traditional open-end fund, right? Uh, greater diversification uh, would include than most comparable uh, mutual funds. No, not true. Lower risk than comparable. No, greater man. No. So here, greatest tax efficiency. What else would I know? I would know that ETFs trade supply and demand. Supply and demand. Open end funds do not. Remember, open end funds are based on the next calculation of the NAV, and the NAV plus the sales charge equals the pop. So I would know that's that calculated about at the end of the trading day. Yeah, well, for mutual funds, that's right, but not for ETFs. They trade like a stock. And then uh, I would also know that ETFs, unlike open end funds, can be purchased on margin. 
right? Because you can't buy new issues on margin. You can't buy open-end funds on margin, but you certainly can buy an ETF on margin. Okay. Got it. All right, what's our next one? So the next one is one, two, six, four, nine, six, two. Six, four, nine, six, two. The purchase of uh, 200 shares at uh, 45 and the subsequent sale two HGF 50 calls at three could produce all of the following except, well, that's kind of a tough one. Now, again, there's a lot of different ways to do options. I'm not sure if you do Dean's method or not. Uh, I do a T. Fire up the T. Fire up the T uh, is indeed, right? So now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to plug this in. Now you can do it any way you want. I like to do it on a per share basis. So I'm out 45 for the stock. I brought in three points for the call. And then, you know, uh, what we are kind of interested in, because this is kind of a weird one. This has got a lot going on. So that would be, I'm just putting that there to remind myself that would be the offset. If I go ahead and, you know, get exercise, I get this thing called away from me. So I'm going to put a little arrow there. Okay, so it could produce all the following except a uh, profit of $2,000. Well. Uh, I don't think so. And the reason I don't think so is because if I plug uh, the maximum gain, right, I have agreed that I will sell that stock at 50. Mm -hmm. You know, if I didn't want to sell that stock at 50, I shouldn't have collected the premium. So if this gets called away from me, this is the disadvantage of a covered call. I don't participate past the strike price. So if we look at this, the most I'm going to make is eight points eight points twice, right? Because there's 200 shares. So the most I'm going to make is $1,600, uh, not 2,000, not 2,000. Okay, uh, let's look at our next one. Could we lose 8,400? Well, let's just see. If this uh, stock goes to zero, if the stock goes to zero, I say we lost 45 points on the stock, but we got to keep the three points on the option. So we lost 42 points on 200 shares. Indeed, we could lose $8,400. We lose that when the stock goes away to zero. By the way, you could just memorize 42, break even to zero is the loss. I am a believer it's better if you could actually do a T, check it out, and then you don't have to memorize as much stuff. But that's true. Uh, a loss of $6,000. Well, if we can lose 8,400, we can certainly lose six, right? Six is on the way to losing 8,400. Right. So, and a profit of 1600 indeed. Indeed, if we get called away at 50, uh, you're going to encounter, I don't think it'll be this hard on your test, but you're definitely going to have four or five covered calls, perhaps. And mm -hmm. I would definitely know why we do it to generate additional income. Very testable. I would definitely know that we do get some price decline protection. We lowered our out of pocket costs from 45 to 42. Right, so we have some price decline protection here. We don't actually lose money until this thing goes to a below 42. I would know 42 is the break even. Uh, another thing I like about the T is it becomes transparent what the break even is. Yeah, right? So now I can just uh, ch check my answer set and see if they offer me a number that if I plug it in there would make it balance. I go, yeah, there we go. There's my break even. Mm -hmm. So you can either memorize that. Oh, you need to that. I would definitely know you don't participate past the strike. In other words, you've got to give up the stock, as we said, at 50. And so I think of options being about floors and ceilings. And so the way we say that is your gain is capped. And what we mean by that is you don't participate past that strike price. So the more bullish you are, the higher the strike you'll write. The less bullish you are, you know, the lower the strike you'll write. Okay, so that was a good one. That was a good one. I don't think it'll be set up that way on your actual exam. But as I said, you will get covered calls. You can get three, four, five covered calls. All right, what's our next one? Cool. So the next one is one, two, eight, three, zero, two, eight. One, two, eight, three. I'm sorry, one, two, eight, three. One, two, eight, three, zero, two, eight. Zero, two, eight. Uh, several years ago, a client purchased a thousand shares of added common stock at 50. Today, the stock's selling for 100. Woo hoo! 
So life is good. Life is good. Uh, the investor is nervous about the future for the market. An order is turned in to sell 10. Uh, Radic 105 calls for two. So uh, we have obligated ourselves to uh, sell our 1,000 shares at uh, 105. And then we buy uh, 10 Radic 95 puts for premium at two. So we now have an obligation to sell at 105 and a choice to sell at 95. Uh, pretty smart customer here. What we're doing is we're selling the calls to pay for the puts. And, you know, there's a caller now. What caller is 105.95, right? We don't participate above 105. Let me get out my annotation tool. And we don't participate. There's our caller. We don't participate past 95. And uh, that's the caller. The caller is 95.105. And uh, we didn't have to pay any money to establish that. So that is called a cashless caller. You should have known this isn't a combination in terms of process of elimination, because you should have known a combination is a straddle with different strike prices. And this is not a straddle. Remember, a straddle would be long a call and long a put, or short a call and short a put. So you should have known it's not a combination. You should know it's not a diagonal spread. Because the spread is long and short, the same type of contract. And we are not long and short, the same type of contract here. Right? The spread would be a diagonal spread would be a spread where there's different strike prices and different expiration months. And you should have known that we don't have unlimited loss potential because we're agreeing to sell stock we own. So I think you should have been able to get to this one through process of elimination. Mm -hmm. Process of elimination. All right, what's our next one? Um, so let's do uh, one, two, eight, three, zero, two, six. Uh, an options investor wishing to follow market neutral. Now, when you hear market neutral, you should know we're selling the option. Because in option strategies, we're either buying volatility or we're selling volatility. And so the minute we see that we are here neutral, it looks like we're going to be selling something, right? So uh, would be the most likely to find in which the most appropriate. Well, we're not buying volatility. You know, in a long straddle, we're buying non-directional volatility, way up or way down. Mm -hmm. In a debit put spread, we're buying downward volatility. We're not here. If we're neutral, we're going to sell the option. We're not going to buy it. A long index call. No, again, that would require volatility. What we're going to do here is a spread, and we're going to generate a credit. We're going to generate credit. The way we're going to do that is we're going to sell the longer-term option. Longer-term option contracts always have greater premiums. And so what I'm going to do is a time spread. So here it says time spreads are also called calendar or horizontal spreads. It consists of two options on the same type and the same strike. You should know that, by the way, a spread is long and short, the same type of contract. The strategy mm -hmm. expects the market to stay relatively level the profit arises from the time decay. So what they're saying here is you're going to sell the option and hope it goes poof, the long one, the one that you are you know, selling that generated the credit. And then, then uh, we're telling you here, long straddle is again movement and debit put spread. So kind of what I just told you, Ray, here. Um, I thought it was a tough one. I think this is a tough one to uh, kind of figure out a time spread, uh, but you could have got there through process of elimination. And it would be a credit calendar spread that we'd be looking for. It doesn't go into that in the rationale, but that's what that would be. The three things to figuring out what things are when they're missing premiums is longer term option contracts always have greater premiums. Mm -hmm. Lower strike call contracts always have greater premiums. And higher strike put contracts always have greater premiums. And there's a mnemonic for the lower strike calls. It's oh, oh, yeah. long lower strike. Yep. Okay. By the way, that works for calls and puts. It works for all spreads. It's just a trick, but it works all the time. Cool. All right, what's our next one? Now, um, those are all the specific uh, ID questions that I had. Mm -hmm. Now, I was just wondering if we can just go through um, muni slash options questions and kind of just work through it. Well, okay. Well, like I say, let's, all right. Well, well, let me get, did I just, I hope I didn't just close up the Capital Q Bank. I think I did. Hold on. Do, 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 do. Yeah, I gotta go back and get it again.
Oh God, wait, I'm just waiting for it to load again. Do, 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 And then being also, I'm about, let's see here, I'm three days out uh, to the exam. Um, wow. Any, any, um, I guess, recommendations? What, what, what are you scoring? What are you, what are you scoring on your practice test? So on the practice exams, I'm getting, I, so I just took one and I got a 63.2. A 63.2. Okay, so we got some work to do. Uh, I would like you to get that to a 70. So, but you got to be careful because your timeline is kind of collapsing. I would, mm -hmm. after we're done with this, uh, I would actually perhaps, uh, have you done a practice exam today? You don't want to, you want to be bright eyed and pushy tailed. I think what I would do is uh, tomorrow, just uh, hit the simulated exam here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, get a score and see if we can get you a 70. We, we need a 70. Don't get me wrong. Many people between 60 and 70 pass. But mm -hmm. if we want to have a margin of safety, uh, we want to, uh, you know, be able to do that. So let's see, unit six. You want to do some immunity? We don't really want to worry about that. We don't want to worry about that. Uh, don't do that. Okay. And in the time we have, and then what do you want to do? Options? Um, so options and units. Okay, so let's do some options. And uh, we'll say we want to do 20 questions. And uh, do we, yeah, we'll show answer explanations. There we go. Okay, the city of Columbus. Oh, can you see my screen? Did I share it yet? No, nope, I can't see it. Okay, hold on. Let me go back and find you. There you are. There we go. Boom. Uh, the, can you see it now? Yeah. Okay. The city of Columbus issued a 20 year general obligation bond at a price of 50. In original purchasers sold the bond for 75 after holding it for seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, this is a zero coupon uh, bond. It's an OID originally issued at a discount. Right. So, uh, here, uh, they're asking us for tax purposes, what is our gain or our loss? And so if we bought it for 50, right, GO 50, and we're going to get back 100% of PARs, so that, what that means is we bought it for 500, and we're going to get 1,000. That means if we held it to maturity, we didn't hold it to maturity here. So, uh, but if we did, we would be accreting, remember this, 500 over the number of years. And the number of years here is 20. So we would take the 500 divided by uh, 20, and we should have written this up $25 a year. Or you see how I got the 25? I said the 50 is 500. That's 50% of par. It's 1,000 we're getting back. So we're making $500 over 20 years. So if we're making $500 over 20 years, that means we're making are going to have to create $25 a year. So now what we do is we're going to take this I'll make my screen here. We're going to take the $25 and we've held it for how many years? Seven years. And let me get my calculator. 25 times seven. So I should have written this bond up $175 from the 500. What I mean by that is we look at this in terms of a graphic. Uh, I haven't had anybody tell me that they've had to actually do uh, a calculation of upward. I've had plenty of people, about 50% I I have to do downward, but, and I'm just showing you what this looks like, right? So we bought this thing for 500 and we're getting back a thousand and we're making that $500 over 20 years. And so that's where I got that $25. Okay, so now if my original cost base, my original cost base was uh, 50. Yeah. And so that's 500. And I should have written this up in terms of my cost base. Uh, what is it, seven years? Seven times 25. And we said when we do seven times 25, that's 175. 
And so my adjusted cost base is now 675. And so boom. So that's 500 plus the amortization of 175. And so my cost base is 675. And uh, now it says, now it says that I sell the bond for 75, right? So uh, I bought the bond here. Now that's my cost base and 75 would be $750. And so that's my sales proceeds. This is my adjusted cost basis. And so the difference between those is? 75 uh, capital gain. Yeah. Boom. A lot of work. A lot of work. A lot of work. For Quick clarifying question. So the difference between adjusted cost basis and just regular cost basis? Yeah, we only do this in uh, bonds. We only do it for, uh, you know, OIDs. And I don't think you're going to have to do it on the test. The cost base is simply when you, you don't, the only time you're adjusting the cost basis is if it's an OID like this. And uh, remember, this is, uh, you know, part of the return from holding the bond. But uh, I don't think, I don't think that's going to be a big deal for you uh, on the exam that you have to, okay. you, by the way, remember you had to do this on your SIE uh, for uh, adjustments for stock dividends and splits, right? So very sorry. All right, let's see what our next one is. Uh, customize a new issue municipal bond in the primary market. Which of the following statements is true? Which of the following statements is true? So, customize a new issue bond and discount in the primary market. So, when you're buying at a discount, it needs to be. Yes, we just did that, right? Yeah, the just did it. So you need Roman number one for sure. So, yeah, eyes one or eyes true. Um, and since it's a community bond, there would be no capital gain. Excellent, excellent, right? Because you've been taking a little bit of hits along the way. Absolutely, yeah. excellent. Uh, and if an indenture has a closed in provision, this means a closed in provision. So in this case, just to kind of walk you through how I'm thinking about it, I would eliminate, I'd eliminate A, and then I would eliminate D. Uh, well, be careful because closed in means different things in different bonds. But if it's closed in, that means people have priority. Okay. In other words, if I sell more bonds behind you, you know, after I've sold you the bonds, then you know people behind you have a junior lien. For example, I'm coming to you from Las Vegas. Yeah. Uh, the Bellagio is completely financed with $2 billion of mortgage bonds. There were four underwritings of $500 million apiece. So mm -hmm. $500 million, we call that Series A. And then we do another $500 million, we call that Series B. Mm -hmm. we did another $500 million, we call that Series C. Mm -hmm. we did the last $500 million, Series D. So uh, who has the junior liens on the Bellagio? It's the people that have the Series B, they're junior to the A bond holders. Mm -hmm. the C's are junior to the B's and the D's are junior to the C's, right? So uh, that's what that means here. It also means an immunity bond, something a little different. Immunity bond, remember, it means can we issue bonds to make the facility operational, which we can if it's closed, but we can't just be issuing bonds in open end. So this is actually D. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, a customer is in a 28% tax bracket, owns a 9% uh, ABC 20-year corporate bond yielding 8.7. This is very testable. Mm -hmm. She is considering buying a tax-exempt security. What is the comparable yield for a muni bond? So 
anytime they give you somebody's you know uh tax bracket, tax bracket you just know that this is the type of question that's coming so in this case i would do 100 minus 28. excellent excellent um, and then i always get taxable and tax-free mixed up but i would in this case divide the 8.7 by Minus are you going to use what would you care for? Are you going to use the 8.7 or the 9? Remember, you're collecting $90 in annual interest. 9% on par is $90. So oh, of that $90, the government's confiscating 28% from you. So you're not going to be using the yield of maturity here. You're going to be so using the 9%. The 9%, okay. So would it be 9 over 72? Yeah, well, your point, you were on the right track. To go from taxable to tax-free, we multiply. To go from taxable to tax-free, we multiply. To go from tax-free to taxable, we divide. Okay. And so here, we have a taxable yield. So if it's a taxable yield, we you multiply. multiply. Yep. So we're going to multiply 9% multiplied by, you were on the right track, 100% minus 28% because 28 cents uh, percent is what the government's taking from her. Got it. So I would just do um, 0 0.09 times. Yeah, that's exactly. You don't want to give up these questions, my friend, because in practical application, there's no interpretation of what the answer is. You simply get it right or you get it wrong, right? So you're going to take 9% times. And, you know, in math, we always do the parentheses first. So that's going to be, and by the way, I suggest you just right out of the gate, just do that 100% minus the 28% because whether you're multiplying or dividing, you know, you got to do that, right? So you're going to need that. And okay, so now we're back in business. So now we got uh, 9% times 0.72, right? That's 72%. So that's what she gets to keep, 72 cents of uh, every dollar. And hopefully now when we do this math, we come up with one of these choices. That's the good thing about math. That's if we do it correctly, we should come up with the uh, answer. 6.48. And I see that is available to us. That's always reassuring. Boom, boom, boom. And uh, I can't imagine a draw in which you're not going to have to do that. Okay. You're either going to have to go to the taxable for this one, like this one. You're going to have to either go from taxable like this to tax-free equivalent or from tax-free to taxable equivalent, to go from taxable, they give you the taxable, we multiply. They give you the tax-free, uh, we divide. Okay, now, um, okay, so, okay, that makes sense, okay. I just had to read the question again. Um, we can go on to the next one. Okay, okay. All the following have the least, or which of the following have the least market risk, the least market risk? So in this case, I would eliminate um, A. Yeah, you know, again, the re remember the way to get this is what we're asking you about is volatility in debt securities. And so it's kind of a ask backwards question in this regard that you should know that longer term maturities have more volatility, more risk. And so, and this is saying least. So if we're asking you least, it's going to be the debt security that has the shortest maturity the shortest maturity. So what this is really asking is, which of these has the shortest maturity? Um, so I'll eliminate A and D. And then I believe notes are two to 10 years. Um, Fannie Mae's. Our mortgages. So I would go with C. You're correct. Good job. And remember, we have revenue anticipation notes. We have tax anticipation notes. We have uh, tax and revenue anticipation notes. I think of these as the muni equivalent of borrowing against receivables. They're short term. They use it to even out their cash flow. Uh, you know, they have their own unique credit rating called a MIG rating. 
you know, make one is better than make two. So all the fall, I like this one. I like this one. All the following subject an investor to unlimited risk except. So here we have three dumb bears and one smart bear. Don't be a dumb bear. So one of these is a smart bear. So I would eliminate C. Yeah, that definitely has unlimited loss, right? And if you're short yeah. and uncovered naked, call. Oh, yeah. That's a really um, dumb bear, by the way. That's a really dumb bear because you're picking up nickels in front of a bulldozer, right? I mean, if mm -hmm. you're right, you just keep the premium. But if you're wrong, oh, my God, you get crunched, right? You're going to have to go in the open market and buy those stocks. So you definitely need to recognize, and you did so, that uncovered naked calls have unlimited risk. So uh, your C is out now because of accept. So you got that. So, yeah, and then I'll eliminate B right away. All right, so yeah, let's get rid of that one. So boom. Uh, what else did you want to get rid of? Um, B. The correct. Again, that's a dumb bear. You yeah. sell stock you don't own, right? In most industries, that's called fraud, but not in ours. Selling stock you don't own is called selling short. So you are now with 50-50. Again, we're asking, what is the smart bear here? So I'll go with A. Excellent. That is effectively hedged. That is a smart bear, man. That guy said, you know what? I think I'll establish the choice to buy back the borrowed stock just in case. That's a smart bear. The Guy who wrote the put, another dumb bear, because to protect this position, you don't want to have an obligation to buy the stock. You need a choice. And so that's why that is such a great transaction, because it changes it from unlimited risks to limited risk. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, all the following are examples of short-term municipal obligations except. So TAN is an example of a short-term uni obligation. DAN is a short-term uni ob uh, obligation. Um, TREN is as well, so I'll go with A. What's that? Did you get your choice yet? I'll go with A. You are correct. Do you remember what state and local governments, not a big deal, but state and local government security slugs are used in pre-refunding of municipal bonds. So when we we're pre-refunding a bond, uh, we take the proceeds, we put an escrow account, what we're allowed to buy or what it calls slugs. But uh, it's certainly not a tan, it's certainly not a ban, so you got it right. Cool. Uh, who attest, oh man, don't miss this one. This is high risk and it's definitely on there. Okay. Who attests to the legality of a bond issue and issues a legal opinion on proposed new municipal bond issue? Um, so this is C. Yeah, listen, if you miss that on the real test, angels weep for you. I mean, if you don't miss that on the real test, I mean, you just should fail immediately. <laughs> you just add your seat, shoot you into the ceiling and say, geez. Now, uh, what kind of a uh, legal opinion are we going to get? We're either going to get test question. Qualified or non-qualified. What's better? So uh, non-qualified opinion. Qualified yeah, opinion. without reservation. Right on. Good job. Good job. An investor is short stock at 70 if the market price is 40. So we're looking pretty good. We sold short at 70. The stock or, uh, is going down. Everything's going according to plan here. Mm -hmm. And the investor anticipates the price will continue to decline. So I think it's going to get better still. Uh, to hedge, hedge means protect. So every time you hear hedge, you should think protect. And if we're protecting something, we need to pay or buy the option. For protection, we buy. For income, we sell. So what would you do here? Buy a call. Right on. What uh, type of order could you use as well? Um, so since you're short, could you... Hmm. You could enter a buy stop order. So there's two buy risk stop. mitigation strategies here, right? Buy a call or enter a buy stop. Uh, which of the following bonds may be secured? Can we go back to question sure. nine. Sure. Um, that acronym BLITZ, could this apply for... Um, well, BLITZ, remember, slobs over BLITZ is to remind us where we place orders in relationship to. I think, yeah, you could say, okay, well, I need something above 40. 
right? The buy stop is that going to have, if we use a buy stop, we're going to have to place it at, you know, 42 or 41, something above 40. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that, you know, you could use that as a reference. So just a minute, Zach, that's, I got a mom's calling. Yeah. No worries. Take your time. One more tutoring thing here. I'm working on it right now and then I'll be done. Okay. Um, I'll be I'm back. All right. So next one. Which of the following bonds may be secured by a lease back arrangement? Um, I would go D. Yeah, uh, housing authority bonds were typically, you know, uh, low income housing units. Uh, we can usually we're going to be doing this for a, a facility and it's going to be actually called a lease rental bond. So you missed that one. Yeah, you know, okay. yeah, not a bad. By the way, you're on pace. That's okay. That's, a, you know, you, you only need to get seven of 10, right? By the way, seven of 10, actually, you can get, if you get seven of 10, you can miss six in a row. And if you just put seven back again, well, you need more than 70%, but you know, you're in the ballpark, so to speak, right? Yeah. Uh, all the following are characteristics of section eight bonds, except. So this is another low income housing kind of scenario. Because that's what section eight is. Now the test, they'll call these public housing authority bonds or national authority bonds. Um, I would eliminate. Um, B, I would eliminate. Yeah, yeah. B is out because that's what they are. It's an accept question, right? So B is true. Yeah, you should definitely. You should definitely know that D is true. You should definitely know that PHAs. Public housing at the Orleans National at the full faith and credit of the United States government. Yep. So D is out. You should definitely know it's about low income housing. So this is kind of a platypus. It's neither fish nor fowl. Now, I don't think they're going to ask you this question on your test on Monday. What I think mm -hmm. they're going to ask you is, uh, do you understand these are directly backed or have the backing of the United States government? Right. That's the test question. Remember this, Jenny Mays, direct obligations to the Treasury. Uh, which of the following is the computation for the coverage ratio of a municipal revenue bond uh, issue? Now, again, I'm not going to make you crunch that. On the test, what you need to know is this has or is associated with a revenue bond. Okay. Coverage ratio. Okay, so... C. Excellent. Excellent, man. That was impressive. I didn't think you were going to get that one. <laughs> That's a tough one. One of the benefits of adding a sinking fund to a municipal bond issue is that the bond will generally um, So I would eliminate A. Mm -hmm. um, I'll eliminate D. Oh, good. I love the way you're going about this. Process of elimination is good test taking skill. So I would say C. Uh, C? C is in Charlie? And... That's all right. It's all right. Hey, listen, uh, you only use this trick when all else fails. But here's a trick for you. Okay. When all else fails. Too long to be wrong. Too, too long to be wrong. So, you know, I'm looking at this answer set and I said, man, this guy really likes B. Whoever wrote this question he likes B because he spent a lot of time writing that answer. It's either mm -hmm. a hell of a distractor, might be right. Now, I suggest learning the material is a better way to go. But when all else fails, I sometimes say, hey, too long to be wrong. By the way, the, the guys who write these questions, 
they are upset when I tell people that, but then they don't realize they fall prey to it themselves. And I say, ah, I've got you. It's too long to be wrong. All the following call buyers' objectives accept. All right, so I would eliminate A. Right over uh, a. So well, now hold on. So if you buy a call. Yeah. Accept. Okay, you're right. So it's accept. So you're correct. So A is true, and we're looking for something that's not. So you are correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm decision to buy a stock. There's a long stock position with the following prices, but if you're, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so I would go with D. Uh, excellent. I remember you you wouldn't buy a call for a long stock, you'd buy a put. Yeah. Excellent. That's kind of what I was thinking about when I was reading. Excellent, my friend. Excellent. All the following statements regarding municipal revenue bonds are true, except, except. Okay, so. Okay, so the limit B. I'd eliminate D. You're eliminating. Um, I'm not selecting D. I'm just eliminating it. Remember, they're asking what is false here. So, A, there's no debt limitation on a revenue bond. That's true. Mm -hmm. The interest and principal are paid from the revenue received from the facility. That's true. Revenue bonds can be issued by enter, enter, or interstate authorities, like the Port Authority of New York, right? The Port Authority of New York uh, covers both New York and New Jersey. Right? That's true. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to finance a facility where your bonds are due after the useful life of the facility, because then, you know, how are you going to make them pay, right? So the one I always use in my lectures is Boeing uh, moving to Chicago. Mm -hmm. They located their headquarters there, and they uh, issued 20-year bonds and the lease for Boeing was 20 years. So when the lease is up, the bonds are up, boom. And now Boeing's leaving. Boeing's like, ah, okay, who wants us now? You know, who wants us now? Uh, all the following option positions have limited loss potential except. I like this one. I, I'm, I think you're going to get this right based on your previous performance. Okay, so limited loss potential except. So I would say short, uncovered calls. Absolutely. Don't be a dumb bear. That's just really, really stupid. Yeah. Now, on an uncovered put, that just means right to put, and that's a lot of money, but it's definable. I say the worst case in that put is somebody's going to stick you to it at the strike price. And if they stick it to you at the strike price, what you lose is, you know, the zero, whatever breaking the zero is. So that's definable. Mm -hmm. So good job. Good job. I thought you were going to get that right because you've been pretty good on that naked, short, covered coal thing. Thank All you. right. An investor sells short 100 shares at 50 and sells a 50 put at five. The put is exercised when the stock is trading at 45. Okay. So for this one, um, I would immediately highlight the sell short 100 shares yeah, at 50. Fire up the T. Fire yeah. up the T. So is that 50? Is that $50 out? So if you're, dollars in? Yep, if you're selling short, um, that's dollars in. Right on. If you sell a put, is that dollars in or dollars out? If you're selling a put, that's dollars in. Boom. If you are short a put, you have an obligation to buy the stock. Mm -hmm. So when the put is exercised, that means you bought the stock at the strike price. So at 45. Oh, wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. The strike price. The strike price. Yes. 
Yep. All right. So are you a happy camper or not a happy camper? So you're out 50 and you took in 55. Yeah. So you're out 50 and you took in 55. So that's a gain of five when you net them. Um, this is an increments of a hundred. So let's see. Excellent. Your client is considering two bonds, an ABC mortgage bond with a coupon of nine, you know, that's secured by real property. That's like my Bellagio bonds mm -hmm. and a municipal bond issued by the state and that she resides in. If your client is in the 32% tax bracket, ding, 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 ding. So we know we're going to do a hundred percent minus 32% and then we're going to do something else. Yeah. What is the tax free equivalent? So they gave so, us the taxable and they asked us a tax free equivalent. So are we going to multiply or are we going to divide? You're going to divide. And you're going to multiply. When you have the taxable one, you multiply, right? So we're going to say, okay, well, that uh, 9%, that $90, you're not getting to keep that. Right, you have to give back some of that. Okay. Uh, by the way, a trick. One trick is you know that it's got to be something less than nine. So you could toss out just in the answer set C. It can't possibly be C because you're nine and the government's confiscating some 32 cents of every dollar from you. So it's got to be something lower than nine. Right. Okay. It's not going to be higher. Now in the muni, it'd be the opposite. It has to be a higher number. So. All right, so uh, you're going to take your, I think you were pretty good on this uh, last time. So I would do 100 minus uh, 32. Yep, yep, that's um, good. 68. Um, and then I would take 68 times 9%. So yep, that's right on. So we're going to take 9, and we're going to times it by 1 minus the tax bracket. So it's B. There you go. Boom, boom, boom. You are going to have to do that. You're going to have to do that. That is on the test. Uh, which of the following details would not be found in the uh, bond uh, resolution for a revenue bond? I, uh, kind of interesting. Uh, you know, uh, one thing I always tell people is a big part of your exam is distinguishing in the muni area between mm -hmm. geo bonds and revenue bonds. And I always would tell people, you know, maybe you should get a sheet of paper folded in half and on one side, write all the terms associated with GOs. And on the other, all the terms associated with a GO bond. So one of these terms is not associated with a revenue bond. Dean, sorry, I lost you. My headphones just disconnected. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. I said, can you hear me now? Hello? Hello? Yeah, now I can hear you. I just lost. Uh, I said that a big part of your hear me? Is yeah, the big part of your exam is distinguishing between geos and revenues. And so that's what this question is. This question is saying one of these things is not for a revenue bond. So, so revenue bonds are backed by a specific revenue source where yeah. geos are taxes. There you go. Uh, so I would say the tax covenant. Excellent. Excellent, my friend. That was perfect. Perfect performance on that one. Our last one, a municipal revenue bond has a catastrophe call. Otherwise, it's not callable. Which of the following statements regarding the well, features of this bond must be described in the customer's confirmation? Uh, I kind of, I like the, what the, I don't like the phraseology question, but I kind of like what it's getting at. Okay, so a muni revenue bond has a catastrophe call feature, but otherwise is not callable. Which of the following statements regarding the features of this bond that must be described in the customer's confirmation is true? It must be designated subject. I would eliminate A. I like that, yeah. Eliminate B. Um, well, B is the actual answer. I don't like the phraseology, but the MSRB says the only call that need not be disclosed to the investor is a catastrophe call. 
So the catastrophe fall is the only call provision that need not be disclosed. So okay. the catastrophe calls provisions associated with municipal revenue bonds are not included in the customer confirmations. I don't think that's really the test issue. The test issue is this need not be disclosed. Only call provision with specific dates are included in confirmation. So the flip of this is if you buy a muni bond at a premium, well, then you must disclose that. You must disclose that. All right, my friend. So uh, you did pretty good. I, as your tutor, I think it was a pretty good performance. I, I, I don't know. Well, let's score it up. I think I marked you wrong. Did I mark you wrong when you were wrong? I'm not sure I did. I think I did. I think I'm, I, that's, that'll get it done. I think there was a couple where I kind of helped you out. But, you know. Yeah, I think the last question I would have gotten wrong. And yeah, well, that's all right. That might be missing. I, that's performances in the ballpark. So this is a commercial Zoom account. So this, as soon as this is ready in about an hour, I'll send it to you. And then uh, when you pass Monday, I will uh, post it for other test takers to see your victorious... Uh, victory lap and we will call it a coaching call instead of tutoring because we didn't really do any tutoring we just did some uh, questions together do you have anything else here before you go into your weekend yeah so just out of curiosity Dean, and first of all thank you so much for spending the time with me. um just through working with me for two sessions here what do you recommend for me to focus on slash i love what i listen as your tutor i'm excited that you wanted to focus on options of muni mm -hmm. i would add <laughs> mutual funds to that Okay. Uh, those are those three areas where just target rich. I mean, function three of the FINRA content outline is called, uh, uh, you know, products, basically. It's about products. It's 91 questions. So that's where I would focus on. You know, we were just, I put away, did I put away the QBank? I don't know if I did or not. Uh, but let me just find it again for you. Um, can you see the screen? Okay, so to answer your question here, part two of the Kaplan Q Bank is actually the function three, where there's 91 questions. And so all the way from unit three, let me just get out my thing here. Uh, boom, uh, boom, 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 boom. All the way from unit three, whoop, come on. I don't know why it's not, let me do, annotate this thing. Uh, all the way from unit three to unit 12 is target rich. Unit three through 12, that's 91 questions on the actual exam. So that's where, to answer your question, that's where I would be spending my time. You know, they organize the test by critical functions. Function one is find a customer. Now, Kaplan does this a little different. So there's part four, that's function one, according to FINRA, go find a customer. And, you know, that's testable, but it's not nearly as testable as the investments, right? And then function two is once you find a customer, that's now Kaplan part one, can yeah. you open an account? And you should, you know, review customer accounts. That's very testable, joint tenants, uh, tenants in common, uh, UTMAs, UGMAs, you know, and then once you uh, open the account, then this is uh, what we just talked about. Once you have an account, you know, you got to buy them a security, right? What security are you going to buy them? I know I'm so pleased with you as a tutor that you ain't going to sell them no naked call. Right? So we're going to test you on uh, things that are clearly unsuitable, right? Mm -hmm. The way you get those right, those suitability questions is by making sure you're strong in the actual products. Okay. Uh, now, of those products, the ones that are big, you just, you know, again, Muni Bonds, which is unit six, Options, which is unit 10, and mutual funds, which is unit eight. So six, eight, and 10 are, uh, you know, the most target rich of that uh, area. And uh, you, like I say, your timeline is collapsing. So don't wear yourself out. So you really, you know, only have like, uh, again, you got to guard your kind of your, your psyche and your energy. And what I mean by that is maybe tomorrow do a practice final, get a score. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Sunday, get some rest because, you know, it's going to be the most important is going to be, are you in top of your reading form on Monday? Do you get a good night's rest? You know, ohm, let it come to you. You yeah. want to be, it's hard to be in a, in a series seven flow, but if you can get into that flow, that's what you maybe need to be thinking about on Sunday. Okay. Got it. Okay. Anything else? Um, just uh, the last thing was, do you notice any weak areas that I can? No, I was pretty pleased. I was pretty pleased. I didn't think you got what the stuff you were wobbly on was kind of esoteric. So, I mean, 
uh, I didn't notice anything like, oh man, that guy better fix that. Yeah, I think uh, right. it's mainly uh, keeping keep grinding and staying the course, right? Yeah. So you know what I would say is uh, keep grinding, stay the course, and then what you got to do on Monday is stick the landing. So the answer is yeah. no. I don't. Uh, I know. I think you're you're circling the airport, and uh, you know, say okay, seat backs up, uh, you know, and let's uh, stick the landing. So I think you're in pretty good shape uh, based on that performance. But uh, drop me do drop me a line tomorrow when you get that practice score. And see okay. if we can give a 70. I would I would like to have that last mark be a 70 plus if we can do it. Okay. But cool. as I said, uh, you know, you're still in good shape. I mean, if I were a betting man, I'd still bet you're going to pass on Monday. Thank you. Thank you. you okay. <laughs> All right. As soon as this becomes available, I'll email it to you. Cool. Thank you so much, Dean. I really appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye.